welcome to this. You know, 20 years ago, when this was just a concept, and the council was talking about, hey, you know, what we really need to do is people need to know how the city works. And that way, when they have a problem, they have a good idea of where to go, who to talk to, et cetera, and how that problem might get worked out. I kind of wanted to talk just a little bit about the fact that we as a community, as a society, I think, we constantly say things like, why doesn't the city do that? What's the matter with the city that they can't get this done and that done, et cetera? And I would like to remind all of you, as well as myself, you are the city. I am the city. We collectively are the city. 38, 39 years ago, the residents of this community voted to create a city. And then they voted for seven people who would represent them and their concerns in that city. And then they decided, those people who were elected said, hey, we don't know everything, duh. So what we need to do is we need to hire experts, experts in streets and, and in social services, in police work, et cetera, because we can't do all that. So they went out and did all that and took all those pesky problems that you and I either didn't want to or couldn't deal with, things like creating roads, having a police department to take care of crime, having social services out there to help people that, that are in need. Um, having recreation programs and getting them together and, and being sure that everything works. So we, all of us, collectively, are the city. We all are. You have access to any one of the council members anytime you want it. Our phone numbers are listed on the website. Call us. We're there. That's our job, is to be there to hear what you have to say. Can we solve all your problems? Probably not. Will we try to help you with your problems? You bet. Another thing that, that has been interesting to me over the last couple of years is this need for instant gratification. I want it now. I don't want it tomorrow. I don't want it next year. I want it right this minute. So city, state, wherever, do it now. What's the matter with you people that you can't do this? Well, <laughs> let's think about that for a minute. An idea, a great idea, takes a long time to come to fruition when it's more than one or two people who have that idea. We're talking about thousands of people in this community, not just one. So I have this great idea. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to sell that to a vast majority of people in this community before I can even get up and running with it, before I can think about, is it financially feasible? Do we have the money to do this? Is it legal? Small incidental, you know, but something I'll need to check on. Um, what's its impact? on everybody, not just a little tiny group, but a huge group of people. What is its impact? Not only what is its impact today, but what is that impact in five years, 10 years down the road? What are the consequences of my actions today to those folks down the road? I need to consider that. So when you get frustrated with what we all call red tape, and we all get frustrated with it, think about all the factors that have to go into planning and getting something started. Look at the park down here, for example. We have a new park. Yay. We got that land through a trade. Fantastic. So we should be able to just walk right in and have a park, right? I mean. Makes sense, there's the park, there's the land, belongs to us, okay, let's go. Whoops, small incidentals, okay. Um, what about the water? 
where do the pipes go and who puts them in? And oops, uh, we need a restroom. You can't have a lot of people in a park without a restroom. So that means we've got to have sewer come there. And oh, wow, the wall that we want to put over there, it has to meet some criteria for safety because we're going to have a lot of people near that wall and we don't want it to fall over on them. So it takes time. While you are going through this class, you will meet each department head and you will find out what each department in the city does and what their responsibilities are. And then you will find out how they work together to reach the goals that are set by the council. And the council sets those goals depending upon what they find out from the community. So while you're in this class, ask questions. Ask them. They're going to get answered in one way or another. Propose things. You have an idea? Hey, get it out there. Let everybody hear that idea. But most of all, have fun. Because this is a great place to have fun. And when you've graduated, you will have the tools you need to join with the nonprofits in the community. You will understand enough about the city to be able to help guide those nonprofits. You'll be able to do Buku volunteering. We have more volunteer positions in this community, I think, than in any community I've ever been in. And they're everywhere. In every department, there is a need for volunteers. So you will be equipped to do that. You will be equipped to join the commissions. You'll be equipped to later on run for council, run for Senate. Do it. Get out there and, and strut your stuff. Have a good time, and I thank you again, and welcome. My goal tonight is to share a little bit uh, about who I am, a little bit about the council manager form of government, talk a little bit about how we are structured as a city, answer to the best I can those questions you have about how we're set up. Trash service is a certain way in Apache Junction, totally different than most cities. Sewer district, completely different. So those type of questions are great and I can try my very best to explain. But, so it starts here tonight for all of us to try to have that dialogue and understand how Apache Junction works so that we can help each other out as we work through different, uh, different things that we work through, challenges. We have a lot, a lot of great things, great opportunities, potential, and, and working together, I think we can accomplish a lot more. How many here have heard the term home rule in the last year? Just as a recent kind of thing. Okay, great. That's great to see. Um, that was a big deal. Um, it passed 75%. Us as an organization uh, spent time sharing the facts about that so that our citizenry would know if it passed or if it didn't, what would happen. We are studying in the process as a staff, another kind of one of the biggest questions I went out to the different groups in the community is, why do we have to keep doing this, Bryant? Because this is like my fourth home rule here. Is there something else we can do? And so we've been doing some studying, and there is. It's called a permanent base adjustment. Sholo, the, town, the city of Sholo just recently passed it. And during that process, uh, what they do is they reestablish the base budget. And I'll explain a little bit more about that some other time. But what it does is it gives us an opportunity to reevaluate that deficit that we would have had in a home rule. But over time, that's something we would like to have an informed citizenry about if we were to go to ask for a permanent base adjustment. So this, it, for me, is a great opportunity to get to know you. And I hope that uh, by the end of the night, you'll be able to ask a few questions. We'll leave some time for some questions. The city of Apache Junction has the mayor and city council. There are seven elected officials, as the vice mayor explained. They hire and they fire three people. Anybody know who those three are? Anybody want to guess? City manager. City manager. City manager. City manager. Fire nope, no, nope, no. Nope. City attorney is a contract position, the city manager and the judge, the, so the municipal part of it. So you kind of have the legislative branch, the way I like to explain it. So you have this legislative branch, our mayor and city council. They, are, or, um, they, they have a, the role of kind of doing ordinances or establishing the law under the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Arizona. 
And they, um, that's what their kind of role is. In addition, they hire and fire the manager and the attorney and the judge. Then the judge, of course, works kind of the municipal part of the, the court, the, the court part. And then we're kind of the staff that executes on the law, doing our very best to do as much as we can as a service organization. We exist to serve our community. That is our mission, is to carry out the wishes. If it's legal and ethical and four, four council members saying, Bryant, go this direction, then we're going to go do it the very best we can. And so that's kind of how we're set up. So for about 10 years, all of our meetings have been digitized and put on a server in the cloud so that people can go and see not only written minutes from the city council, but actually what they said, how they said it, and what framework that was in. And then uh, we were very innovative on that part of it. And then the other part was the, what we call agenda management. How and what, when you see the city council and they have their packet of information, you always wonder, what are they looking at, what they have? It's actually this exact same packet of information that's on our Legistar website. Nothing more, nothing less is exactly what, what, what you all as a public can, can and absolutely should have. So they understand what they're looking at to help, help their decisions. So then once they say, all right, we got a city manager, we want you to go carry out some functions. And we want to, and we sit down and we'll say, we'll have like a strategic uh, uh, plan set up and say, what, do you, what is it, your, your highest goal? Well, we want a community that's safe. And so every year I hear, we need a, a great public safety department. So a big portion of our budget, pretty much half of our city budget, is the police department. I said, but we also want quality of life issues, Brian. We want to make sure we have an outstanding library. And, and does anybody use a library here? Yeah, it's a great. Yeah, I love it too. Our kids have loved it. And a parks and rec program. And so we have programs there. And then, then they say, okay, well, we want to be able to have code, and we want to be able to help our private property owners. And so we have a co-compliance division within development services. And so we have a development services department. And then there's, of course, the street and roads, and we have a public works director. And so all these different functions carry out um, the wishes of the council. But how do they do that? How do they execute on it? What do they need? Money, tax dollars. And so that's a sacred trust. Because in order to do that, you have to ask our citizenry, okay, this is what we want to do. And so, um, through the different mechanisms, and in our case, our city has yet to do what's called a property tax. Now you say, why well, pay property tax, Bryant? Do you all own property? Yeah. So if you look really, really close at the line items, you'll see all the different districts. Central Arizona Community College District number one. Superstition Fire Medical District number one, or whatever it says. Pinal County. And then even within like AJ Unified School District, there's what are called secondary and primary taxes. So you'll see what you're doing through your assessed valuation. It's important everybody understand how, that, how that's kind of, how it's coordinated. We do not, we function mostly on a sales tax and intergovernmental revenues from the state. A portion of your income tax based on our city population goes to the state and then it comes back to the city. So about 25% of our revenues come from there and about another 70 or 65% come from our, about 50% come from our sales tax. So when you go to Walmart and you pay your, your tax, it's pretty close, it's just under 10%. But does 10% come back to your city? No, 2.4% of that. So I'm trying to draw a picture of what all that you get and what you think about is the government, your streets, your roads, your police, your fire, and all these different things how that revenue and where that revenue comes from. It comes from basically 2.4% of your sales tax, and then it comes to us through intergovernmental revenues. Our goal is to try to get as much as we can with that, and then only on occasion when necessary ask for a, a sales tax. And recently we did that with a street and road tax, and then recently we did keep um, a tent. Uh, so when we built these facilities that were in the, 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 the recreation center, those that have been around more than 15 years, um, the city of Apache passed its first capital improvement program or as a community, uh, kind of a, a capital facilities um, budget or a tax, and it was 0.2% as well. And that revenue stream built City Hall, the multi-gen, the skate park, the, um, the, um, um, the pool, it was an upgrade to the pool, that zero depth pool and the slides, the rodeo grounds, a little bit of Phelps Drive, um, and I'm very pleased to say, as a city manager, who has a responsibility of the, 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 you know, making sure we can pay our bills, is those, those facilities are all paid off. Our debt to ratio, our debt ratio to what we bring in in revenue a year is very small. 
The only debt we have as a city is about $280,000. That's a lot of money, <laughs> but when you have a $40 million budget, $280,000 a year to help pay off for the last library expansion we had is our debt service, what we call debt service. And we've got about 15 more years on that. So impact fees in Arizona are very, very common. Every city that is a fast growing city, so the philosophy or the public policy behind that is you have existing residents who have paid for a certain amount of acreage of parkland, for example, or a certain amount of roads. And when, let's say, the day comes and we get another big subdivision, and that subdivision comes in, per house we'll charge uh, $3,500 per house for a road impact fee. What that does is that come, comes in to the city funds, and those revenues can only be spent for new roads in that area or to build capacity within the system. And so what it does is it reduces the impact on existing residents. So it's an idea of future residents should help contribute to build the next park that we have or the future, the next branch library that we have or the next or the next kind of thing. So we have what's called retail um, sales tax leakage. I've lived here as much as I want to shop, as much as I can, my wife and I, we do. We come to Fry's, we come to Walmart as much as we can, but we had to buy a washing machine. We had to buy, you know, some other big ticket items, a lot of our clothes. Unfortunately, that's just not here. And so what we did a few years back was we hired a group to help. So every time any one of us in Gold Canyon, Kearney, Hayden, Winkleman, Apache Junction shop, what happens? A little digital imprint, right, if we use a credit card. And so that data actually is collected for good and for bad. I want to get into the privacy issues, but that data is collected. <laughs> you can hire, and we did, we, found, we have hired a group to help us understand what is our greatest leakage you know, that's leaving. So, for example, we found out, we weren't surprised, that like Harley Davidson, we've, we've got that market covered. A, we actually are an importer. So yeah, not surprised, right? But we did find out places like that I just said, where we go shop, we need to go after. So we're specifically targeting those right now as we speak because we have a fries that's going to go from 60,000 square feet to 120,000 square feet. But I've got in about a year a problem because <laughs> there's going to be an empty 60,000 square foot building in our city. Now we've been very, we've worked very hard with some of our local businesses. When Food City left in April, like, oh, you know, and local government can only do so much. I'm not sure how much you want the local government involved in tax incentives or trying to say, Food City, please don't go. Basher, please don't go. You're a big corporation, big corporation. We're going to give you a tax break, right? I don't think that is something that we need or want to do. That's not what we do. But it was very sad they left. They made a choice. It wasn't a huge performing store. And shopper supply is now going to be moving in. They need to expand. They're doing great. It's wonderful. They're, they're, they don't, I, I say they aren't selling M&Ms. Those things are, they sell a lot of big ticket stuff. It's kind of like Bishop's Trailers. I don't know if you know where that business is at. Those are really expensive, you know, horse trailers. And so that sales tax on that brings a lot of money in. And then we have a shift where Superstition Feed, I don't know if you guys know where Superstition is. Yep, right here. It's actually owned by a company called Pet Club. Pet Club is going to be moving into the new, um, shopper supply, that facility. So we're having a little shift there, and then Fry's is gonna move over here across the street off Old West Highway in Idaho. Yeah, so I don't know, I hear hundreds of rumors, y'all, and I have, I, have, I, have, I have seven, but we gotta move forward. There's a lot on the train that we have to move forward, and you hear a lot about that, so I, I, I can't, yeah, I'm just telling you what I know, and that is that food, the, the food city that's empty is not coming anywhere. Shopper supply is going there, Superstition Feed is a pep club, is really what it is, and they're moving into the, into the shopper supply. We, I don't know if anybody was here about 10 years ago, off of Idaho Road. So we have an, a big issue we can talk about, and that's land ownership. Remember when I talked about our country and how great it is? Well, a lot of it goes back to private property rights. When I started finding out in Ecuador, when I lived, a lot of the people didn't own property. They couldn't get a loan. They couldn't buy property. They couldn't own their own stake. We can, right? We can own our own property. We can do. Well, th this is one of the major things um, that we have against us is that north of us is a lot of BLM land, east of us is the Superstition Wilderness Area, and south of us is a lot of land that's owned by the State Land Department. It's not Farmer John like in Queen Creek or in Santan Valley. It's not farmland where they have water rights. It is almost predominantly all state land. And there are 80 acres that are just south of 60 on Idaho Road, just east of Idaho Road, just south of 60, 
that used to be owned by the same company that owned where um, Best Buy and everybody went. It was called Diversify Products. And they came in and they, we entered into a development agreement with them to do a big power center where a Lowe's could have gone. But they were banking on, the, this was in like 2008, the, the reset, they were banking on the market just to keep going and it didn't. And so we have, um, from my perspective, a challenge on that end. And they really want to be able to see before they put in a huge power center, what I call 360 degree market. They wanna see development starting to happen south of 60. About 10 years ago, for those who were around, may have remembered a gentleman by the name of Jim Rhodes. Jim Rhodes was from Las Vegas. He purchased about 1,000 acres south of Baseline Road for about $59 million. This is 2006, 2007. And uh, during that time, he was planning a master plan community that you all would consider just like Verado, just like DC Ranch, just like all these places you see everywhere else. The city government did everything it could. We did a development agreement. We got that auction. We helped them get to the state land. And then as he was doing his planning process, about a year and a half into it, figuring out where water was going to come from, where the sewer was going to be done, everything dropped. The price of that value of that land went from 59000 an acre to about, we think, 20000 and, and it, and it was going to take some time. So we held on to it for six years. <laughs> Finally, our former city manager, our council said to the state land department, the owner, hey, you all got to wake up, kick this guy out of here, you know, get going. You got to, because that was still a contractual relationship. Finally, they said, you're done. You never paid an interest payment. You never paid a loan. That now goes back to the state land department. So my goal, and I've been tasked by this, by the city council to be a gnat, a mosquito. How else do I say it? Anyway, uh, a test to the owner of that land. So we've got 12 square miles from Meridian Road to basically it's the Barkley alignment, but it's, it's really uh, Mountain View Road, baseline to Elliott Road. It's 12 square miles. It's already, it's already planned. We've got it. We've got, in fact, we've got, I, um, the city, Marin City Council have planned for a, a thousand acre feet of water. And when the water director is here, he'll tell you how much water that is for a hundred years from the Gila River Indian community. Our sewer district tomorrow can take on another million gallons a day. It can double. So the state land department knows that. They know they've got a municipality ready to go. We've planned for it. We're ready to go. We need them to sell. The process to get state land to, dis to get it sold is not an easy one. They have to go through a complicated process because it's state land. But they have to go through what is called an auction process, an application process. It takes nine months to get all the surveying do done and all of that. Once that's done, they literally go down to Florence and they do an old, old time auction, 2,500 for, you know, this. And when that happened last time, there were two people bidding on the land. One was a group out of Australia, believe it or not, called Lindley's. They had done the original due diligence on the 12 square miles. And they were like, well, who is this guy from over here? Kept outbidding him. And it started like at $30,000 per um, acre. And then it ended up at 59,000. So it almost doubled in that auction process, which... My boss came back, I remember that day he came back, he goes, Bryant, I can't, you won't believe it. There was two people there and they were outbidding each other and it ultimately caused the problem. So lend lease lost like a million bucks. <laughs> so you take a big risk in going through that whole process and then you don't get the land. You, get, you, know, you can't just go down to, and that's one of the things, I have a map, it's one of my favorite maps. Anybody wants to come see it, I'd love to visit with you and show you what the valley looked like with farmland in Santan Valley. 11 years ago, you saw all the farms. And then I, it's, a land, it's a land ownership map. And so I have on there as well as a layer, all the blue. The blue represents state land, land. So if you go down Ironwood Road right now, you notice right where that ends and, if, and where that development start is exactly where private land begins. It's a germane road. Okay, so in 1996, while we, while we incorporated as a city in 1978, it took us 18 years to get a sewer, okay? When that sewer happened in 96, it was a, uh, as I understand, I wasn't here yet, I started in 2001. It was a mess, there was a lot of misinformation, it was just an absolute mess. But what it did do was start the process for Apache Junction to bring in its first subdivision. So Renaissance Point, um, a bunch of subdivisions. In fact, in 01, we did as many permits as Tucson did that year. My whole neighborhood, Cortez Ranch, um, Arizona Goldfield, all these neighborhoods, Ironwood States 1, Ironwood States 2, we had over like 1,000 homes being built, 700 homes. So I, can, I would argue 
that yes, the reputation has something to do with it, but we're, we don't have land. We don't have a pulte saying we need a square mile to build. Do you know what I'm getting at? So if they had that, or a quarter mile, or just a section of land, because I believe whether or not our name or anything like that, people came. We went from 20,000 to 35,000 people like that, remember? And so that does temper my feelings about, you know, what could happen or what couldn't happen. I just realized that we have to always have a culture of continually improving. We have to review. When we went through the last couple of years, some of our um, fees and rezoning or our, um, planning fees, engineering, we hadn't touched some of those in years. So, you know, it's time to do that and the one coming up. And we would love to have you be a part of that discussion. Like um, the vice mayor said, this is your city. This is your opportunity to come in and help us. Oh,